Hello, everybody. Welcome to, uh, well, the sociological segment for today. I am Mark Smith. I am a sociologist. I work with an organization called the Social Media Research Foundation. And we're here in California, in Redwood City, and around the world, as you will see shortly with our, uh, if I can find it here, hang on a second, there's our, so we're here to talk about the social side of the social web. Um, in many ways, the surprise of the internet is that it became a scaffolding for social relationships. It was not intended to be a scaffolding for social relationships. It was intended to make efficient use of uh, expensive supercomputing uh, compute cycles. And instead, what we have is a place where millions, if not billions, of people now flock, gather, and form relationships. Um, the people in uh, the academic world who study the form of relationships are sociologists. Sociologists are social scientists who uh, study a, a variety of social formations, but there's a subsection of sociologists who study social networks. And social networks are any network that have more than one human in them. And so you're probably familiar with computer networks, uh, and we know about electrical networks, financial networks, uh, and then there's also epidemiological networks, who sneezes on whom. Uh, we in sociology are interested in particular in social networks, who communicates or has a relationship with whom. And in some cases, those relationships get mediated. Uh, sometimes I don't necessarily like or follow or friend you, but you have a page or a photo, and that artifact acts as an intermediating object. Uh, but interestingly, what happens online is that crowds form. Uh, large groups of people gather, and whenever large groups of people gather, it's often considered to be newsworthy. If I told you that hundreds gathered right now in front of San Francisco's City Hall, um, that would be newsworthy. And if I said they were protesting or they were in support of something, that becomes very newsworthy. Uh, whenever 750,000 of your closest friends gather, you can often make history or change it. Uh, the issue for sociologists now is that um, crowds now gather in the virtual world more than in the physical world. If I told you that hundreds, if not thousands of people were gathering in front of uh, San Francisco City Hall, you would be surprised in part because that really doesn't happen that often. It's very expensive for people to gather in the streets. And so people gather online. They tweet and they go to Reddits and they have emails and Facebook posts and they have Instagram posts and all of this activity, all of this uh, tweeting and posting and clicking and liking and following and friending, uh, this is the stuff of social media and it's hard to bring into focus. It's hard to really say meaningful things about this stream because in many cases it's being looked at as if it was a bunch of individual messages or, in some cases, melted down into one big pile of words. Sociologists have a slightly different perspective on things. We do not just see a bunch of messages or atoms. We don't see individuals as really individuals, frankly. Um, we're not the most mainstream American ideology out there. You know, People are not individuals. They're actually the overlapping fields of their relationships. And so what we're interested in is figuring out how to see the crowdness in a online crowd. How do we recover that information? Because after all, if a physical crowd in front of a politician looked like a tweet stream, all of those people would line up single file and it would lose all of the crowdness of it. How big is the crowd? Is it an angry crowd, a frightened crowd, a divided crowd? What kind of crowd? And I would argue as a sociologist that we are all sociologists, some of us are just professional, in that human beings by their nature make judgments about the activities of groups of other people. And so can we find the crowdness in a tweet stream? And the answer of course is yes, yes we can. Um, 
these are the social network connections among a group of people tweeting about a particular topic. It's um, the last president of the United States. Uh, and what it shows is that the crowd is not a single crowd. It was, at this point in history, at least two crowds. And that these crowds form not because of their language use, because we don't calculate it that way, but because of their social connection patterns. Some people connect to some people more than others. And so rather than being a social venue in which opposites clash, although we hear a lot of stories about conflict online, what we actually see are two isolated, polarized, but dense communities. Communities of people who share possibly a political orientation, probably a political orientation, but what they really share from a uh, computational perspective is they replied and mentioned each other more than people on the other side of that divide. And it turns out that in social network theory, we have this idea or this observation. It's called homophily. And you know this idea in English by the phrase, birds of a feather flock together. Now, of course, in English, we also have the phrase, opposites attract. And those two things contradict each other. But work with me here. Birds of a feather flock together. So the assumption here is that if you reply or mention or talk to other people, you're actually probably more in agreement with them than disagreement. As a result, we see these clusters form. We form these clusters using some uh, clustering algorithms. We're using something in this case known as Clausett, Newman, Moore. We offer in our software a variety of them. There are three that we are offering. And what it finds is that there are these people over here and these people over here, and they're more connected to themselves than to each other. And we have helpfully colored them red and blue, but you could guess their orientation if you've been following along on the American political scene by looking at the words or the hashtags used most frequently by the people in that group. So note the flow here. First came connection, then cluster, then content. So in many cases, we first start with content, then we go to a cluster. So what I'm looking for here is some sense of who's who. And if you're talking about, let's say, Rubio and the GOP and the Tea Party, you're on one side. And if you're talking about taxing Wall Street and forward on climate, you're probably another kind of person. And so this is an illustration of the way that people tend to cluster into their opinion tribe. And so our goal is make these kinds of maps easier for mere mortals. I assume I am in a room of demigods. You all are coders. Are you not any software developers in the room? I guess, was that like, of course we're all software developers. Okay, yeah, so, so most of us are not software developers, myself included, and uh, as a result, uh, I'm really good at pressing buttons. And if you have a button for me to press, I can press that button. Uh, the challenge we've had is that there was not that button to press. The go get me a network, analyze it, visualize it, do a content analysis, and write me a report. That button. So we built that button. There is a button. We call that Node Excel. There is a button. It sticks inside of Excel. And when you press that button, you get networks in the same way that you might get pie charts. And so the opportunity here is to bring network theory to the corporate desktop, to make network a first class citizen of the desktop in the same way that pie chart and bar chart and scatter plot is. And admittedly, most people can't go past bar chart, pie chart, scatter plot. Usually taxes the graphical visualization capacities of most viewers. And I am trying to sell you now the uh, n-dimensional, you know, exponentially more complex uh, graph. But work with me here. Trust me, the world is made out of networks, and the world is a complex place. Networks that come out of it, they're complicated too. But what we can do is reduce complexity into certain key observations that I think most people faced with a graph want to get. So this is just to note that our historical roots don't go all that far back. In 1933, it's the first published mention in the New York Times of this thing, network theory. 
Admittedly, prior to that, it was called topology, and the mathematicians had their way with it since uh, Euler, I think it was 17, when? 1786, Euler does uh, the Bridges of Konigsberg problem, and he invents topology. Um, as swift as they are, the sociologists, a mere 225 years later, are right on the case and apply it to social relationships. And he starts by actually drawing the relationships in Shakespeare plays and then starts to use this method uh, to figure out why was it that a rash of runaway behavior takes place at an all-girls school in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, uh, this in the early 1930s. And so this methodology now has blossomed, particularly since the late 80s when the IBM XT allowed even social scientists to get grant money enough to get a computer. What we now have is a burgeoning industry of network tools and data sets and methodologies for doing all sorts of things, including characterizing the culture of your favorite large technology company. And I will note that this is a cartoon and not data, uh, but if you follow the link at the top, uh, it, it's a good cartoon. So uh, I spent 10 years at Microsoft. I assure you that that has nothing to do with reality. Uh, and and I, I live near Oracle, so uh, the idea that the uh, engineering department is dwarfed by the legal department is somewhat amusing, so that, that's kind of interesting. And I, I guess this is the apple of old where the red dot is Mr. Jobs. So the idea is that you could actually capture some of the flavor, the organizational structure, the differences in the ways that groups of humans can connect. Because it turns out that humans are not atoms. Or if they are, they have a habit, like atoms do, of clumping up into molecules. And perhaps the right unit of analysis for our understanding of humans is not at the atomic level. Maybe it's at the molecular level or even higher. And so what we want to do is make these kinds of structures easy to get at. And so we're inspired a bit by this device. Uh, this is the technology that made photography a hobby. This is the Kodak Brownie snapshot camera. And over the course of the lifetime of it and its children, before it went extinct, around 2006, I think, uh, the, the chemical camera pretty much died off as we know it. Uh, but you know, for about 100 years, it had a good run. And it meant that you have pictures of your grandparents in their bathing suits. Um, you know, we all do have these, you know, snapshot pictures of the day-to-day -day life of people all around the world because photography became really, really easy. So can we now do that uh, ourselves, but for a different kind of thing? I mean, obviously, you can take pictures easily. You could get a disposable camera, or maybe what we really want is to be a digital camera. But it's worth noting that this also went extinct just recently. Nobody would ever buy one of those. So what we want to be is this. We want to be the digital camera uh, someday on your phone. And it doesn't take pictures of crowds. It takes pictures of virtual crowds. So they're out there, the hashtags, the groups, the memes, the discussion boards. Uh, we want to be able to go and take pictures of them. Uh, with a button you press and then let it do all of the stuff metaphorically that a camera would do. It's going to do white balance, and it's going to you know, figure out all of these different exposure meter issues. In the same way, you should be able to go and press a button and say, go get me a network, analyze it, visualize it, uh, write a report about it, email it to somebody, and put it on the web for me. And so this tool basically fits inside of a spreadsheet, and it makes it easy for people who do not know that Python is not a snake or they only think Python is a snake. That's it, that's, it. that's the way I wanted to put it. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of those humans out there. Uh, but all of us are in networks. And the more you become aware of that, you become, well, you begin to have that thing we call the sociological imagination. Uh, and that's actually the title of a book by a guy named C. Wright Mills from back in the 50s and the 60s before he was hounded to death. Uh, he was a sociology professor at Columbia, and he wrote books like The Power Elite, uh, and another book called The Sociological Imagination, in which he tried to convey this notion that if, um, especially in, in the United States, it, 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 there is this 
uh, inclination towards psychological explanations. Somebody loses their job, you figure, well, there's something wrong with that person. C. Wright Mills liked to write about the idea of social forces when 100,000 people lose their jobs. It's really hard to explain that by 100,000 psychologies. You're looking for something at the sociological level. So what we want to do is make it for easy for people to be more sociological in their thinking and to be more sociological, what you have to do is think link. When you can think link, you start to think about edges. You start to think about relationships between things rather than the attributes of a thing. You start to think about the attributes of the relationships between things. And so we want to encourage you to get a second monitor. And with that second monitor, spread everything out and be in an environment conducive to the exploration of collections of connections of these connected structures. And this one is a Twitter network structure, but they don't have to be from Twitter. They could be from Facebook. And they don't have to be from social media. Uh, we have one user I'm very fond of discussing, uh, Dr. Diane Klein. Uh, Dr. Klein is a professor of Greek antiquity at George Washington University, that's Klein with a C, C-L-I-N-E. And Dr. Klein has been using uh, Node XL to map the six degrees of Alexander the Great, if you type that in, the six degrees of Alexander the Great. She's taken ancient Greek text and with a yellow highlighter figured out every sentence that said, and then Alexander did something with somebody at some time. And I believe she used photocopies because they really don't like it if you use the yellow highlighter on the originals. It's unfortunate. So it turns out, though, that she's collected thousands of these, what you would probably call tuples. You know, who did what with whom, when, and where. And within a few clicks, that gets turned into now a diagram and a publication, which you can Google. And that has actually led to the formation of the American Historical Association's Historical Network Subgroup. So historians now are mining all of these original texts. Uh, the, the one I'm most familiar with most recently is uh, the Salem Witch Trials Network. Who denounced who as a witch? She's a witch. Burner. And so uh, it turns out that it was actually a uh, class struggle between the newly rising merchant family and the older established agricultural rich family. And they were being eclipsed by the new family and they attacked by denouncing the female members of the opposing family. Uh, and this can be seen in a diagram. Uh, these diagrams are really hard to make if you're not a software developer. Uh, but not anymore. Now, if you can type into a, a spreadsheet, lots of people around the world are now able to point this camera at their local issues. Because, you know, sitting here on the peninsula in San Francisco, it's a particularly blinkered view of the world. If it's not trending here or in New York, maybe it didn't happen. But when we have users from around the planet, we're starting to see what does a hashtag map look like in Seoul or in Jakarta? What's it look like when it's from Canberra? What does politics look like in British Columbia versus in the United States? And we're number one. The most polarized social media discussions anywhere on earth, right here in America. We won't talk to each other more than anybody else won't talk to each other. And so the only way to know that is by sending these cameras, if you will, or these sensors out into the environment around the world to encourage people to picture their own networks. It could be your own personal network, but it could be the hashtags or groups or other discussion spaces that matter to you. So um, we're the SMR Foundation, Social Media Research Foundation, and um, part of the way we support the growth in education around social networks is to make social networks something that you might see online much more often. It's worth noting that web browsers don't really show you webs. They show you pages. They really are page browsers. Um, we're going to try to claim that this is a network browser, and we have a site called the Node XL Graph Gallery. You can think of it as Flickr for networks. 
but nobody uses Flickr anymore because it's owned by Verizon now. And so maybe we could call it Instagram for graphs. So we'll think of it as Instagraph. And like Instagram, it's a place for our users to upload their images and annotate them. And there are a variety of them. And I think that's an important point to be made, that networks and social networks and social media networks are not all the same that like molecules, they come in a variety of shapes and structures and their shape and their structure actually tells us something. In fact, the same set of atoms can form different kinds of molecules and behave dramatically differently. And so as you look at some of these images, I, I hope that you'll be asking yourself the question, what, what does that mean? But at this point in that process, note at least, distinctions, differences, there are not uniform patterns, and some patterns do reoccur. And so the goal is to start to generate so many of these images that we can start to say of any particular one, oh, that's of this kind. It has those patterns and that structure over here, there and the proportion of these kinds of people to those kinds of people, that means something. And so, we are building a series of tools to make it easier and easier to actually get a picture of a hashtag or a Facebook group or the cache of ancient Greek documents that describe the life and times of Alexander the Great. Uh, the, the key point is that so much of the world is made out of information about who did what, with whom, where, and when. Uh, after all, it's just metadata. Uh, but with all of that metadata, what we've had, uh, in some cases famously, was a, a failure to connect the dots. And what we need are better tools for dot connecting and to broaden or democratize the dot connecting tools so that more people can be dot connectors. Uh, clearly, all forms of social media form social networks. If your social media does not form a social network, it is not social media. It might be digital media, but it's not social media. All social media encodes ties between human beings. And so when it does that, it also leaves machine readable data about it. And this is a wonderful thing because in the old days, sociologists ran after people with clipboards and pieces of paper and stubs of pencils and they would ask you, hey, do you know Sally in accounting? And do you know Bob in marketing? And do you ever talk to him about problems in the business? And this kind of data collection works. Uh, it's expensive, it's slow, and now you're slacking and you're yammering and you're chattering and you're emailing and you're posting and you're, uh, you know, all of that just leaves footprints in the sand and, and it tells us all we need to know about who did what, with whom, where, and when. And, and that kind of data, the idea of having a collection of connections is important. It's really what the world's been made out of for years and years and years, and yet the tools for getting at it, thinking about it, they're denied to most. Um, I have a daughter who's uh, 16, just finished 10th grade, woo -hoo, and uh, at one point brought home geometry homework and it said the word vertex, I got excited, and she said, calm down, Dad, you know, it's not your kind of vertex. Uh, and, and I questioned why. Shouldn't it be my kind of vertex? And my kind of vertex is the dot in a graph. It, a vertex is a thing that's connected to another vertex with an edge. And why don't we teach kids about networks? Why don't we teach ourselves and the population as a whole? Uh, and, and my guess is that it would be good uh, because once you really see the world as a network, and once you do, you can't stop, you realize that damage to any part of the network is damage to all of the network. And, and maybe that's a positive message. Um, so when you look at the web, you can see that there are many kinds of ties. There's many ways that somebody authors this link or tie, the association, the bond with somebody else. And if you think about it, unless you are a software developer, the, the average user mostly is doing this. Every favorite, every follow, every link, like, and reply, rate, review, all of those things, it's an edge. And so what we want to do is see that edges are everywhere. They're the universal uh, data structure on all of these platforms. And to then recognize that uh, the way that they are the same or different might be 
in the way that they allow for people to author differently structured networks. And, and this means that we could start to say, well, in what way is Instagram the same or different than Twitter? In what way is one hashtag the same or different from another hashtag? And, and not say that from a kind of qualitative, and I'm not knocking qualitative, but uh, you know, the 10 minutes, yes sir, can do. Uh, the, the challenge with qualitative data is that uh, there is now more of it than a human may consume. I think if you are trying to study the tweet stream related to American politics, and you are not some kind of synthetic human, you cannot read 15 million tweets a day and really come away with some meaningful summary. And so the machines have made it possible for humans to create more content than humans can meaningfully consume. And so it'll just be their job to get us out of that problem. Uh, and they can, because a lot of that content can be compressed in some sense. It can be distilled into certain kinds of structures and patterns. And so once we see that it's really just made out of different kinds of edges, they come in different flavors and directions. And of course, you, you probably recognize the tuple. You know, it, it's the thing with the thing at a time with a payload. Uh, but getting that data structure to be safe for the non-programmer uh, and then to make it so that it's, it's just a thing that you see in a spreadsheet, you press a few buttons, and why bother? Uh, well, because there's insight to be had. Uh, because there is not a single pattern of network. There's a variety of patterns of network. And in the same way that you, you might ask a geographer, well, why do I want to see this map you call like the land? Why would I want to see a map of California? Uh, you know, there are valleys, there, there are mountains, uh, there's a river or two, and um, you might want to know where on that landscape you sit. Uh, similarly, uh, we think it's interesting that there are a variety of patterns, and, and these patterns are derived from Twitter, uh, and we do believe that um, we, we limit the claim to places like Twitter that have reply as an edge type. But what this shows, and you can follow the deeper stuff uh, with our report, report about it with Pew, uh, but in this report we basically say, look, there are all these shapes and structures, there's the hub and spoke pattern, which essentially means the audience. Uh, there is a bridge who is the, the usually rare connection between otherwise disconnected groups. And then the ever popular island who is typically ignored but an important part of our networks, uh, the people with zero connections, are proof that you are a brand. And so uh, these different patterns then tell us something. You can start to look at these and see, uh, there's the six kinds. So these are the six different, these are those six patterns shown before but now with real data. And so this is what happens when Americans talk to themselves about tax policy, uh, which is to say they don't really talk to themselves. They, they sort of have this uh, us and them discussion. Uh, this is what happens when uh, it's a small town or a village in cyberspace. Everybody knows everybody. These are the people who are community managers. And uh, this is what a brand looks like. These are people who mentioned the handset, the Lumia, saying things like, I'm thinking about getting a Lumia, I got a Lumia, I regret having gotten a Lumia. Uh, they might say those kinds of things. Uh, these are people who were talking about the previous uh, first lady of the United States, uh, a different pattern. And then this, the hub and spoke pattern, this is when all the arrows point inward at the hub. And that's what we think of as uh, broadcast or audience. But it's the opposite of the support pattern. And this is where Dell tries to listen and tries to care. Um, and in this case, the hub points outward at lots of people rather than the other way around. So in this case, you see a lot of people retweeting Paul Krugman because he wrote an article in the New York Times. And in this case, it's Dell listens trying to say, hey, send us your laptop again and we will fix it. So um, there is a copy of this book floating around out there somewhere. Does anybody have the book in front of them? Is the book around? If you haven't seen it and you want to get a PDF copy of it, you should put your name and an email address on that yellow sheet of paper and you'll get a PDF of it. And I, I should say the names of my talented and remarkably handsome co-authors. Uh, that's Derek Hansen up there at the top and he's a professor at Brigham Young University. And in the middle, uh, Ben Schneiderman, professor of computer science at the University of Maryland. 
And so uh, that's our data flow. That's what we do, and we do it with a click or two, and the point is to make it so that uh, the users don't have to think too much about it. Uh, instead, they should think about what you get at the end, which is insights into connected things. And that's going to tell you things like, who is most central? Who is the mayor of my hashtag? Uh, it's going to let you ask questions like, how does my hashtag or group uh, or discussion space compare from a network perspective with my competitors? So, it's important to think that the same number of people can form dramatically different structures and that knowing how many people or how many posts you have is not enough and that you also want to know how they connect to each other. So those are our six kinds. We do not argue that there is not a seventh. We, we want to be sort of like social physicists and say, welcome to the beginning of our periodic table of the social elements. Uh, these are the structures we've discovered so far. If you can find number seven, we only request you know, data to prove that seven is a naturally occurring and frequently occurring structure. Um, with that, I think there may be a few minutes left. Maybe there'll be some Q&A. Should we have Q&A? Yeah, sure. There may be Q&A. With that, I thank you for your time. OK. And sure. Thank you, sir. So you're describing uh, some static uh, conditions in mapping up static conditions. I assume to sort of build an intuition about your model you're looking at. Do you know if there's any uh, qualitative difference to looking at the delta between those snapshots, uh, the movement between these groups, and would that be modeled in like the same way as its own metadata, or is there any qualitative difference that you would model? I think I've got, uh, you know, we have a time series back here somewhere that just illustrates that uh, somewhere in there that um, you can take a look at it over time and find spikes and use in the client. Uh, sliders that will allow you to, let's say, narrow the network structure, uh, limit the edges displayed to only the ones that are, let's say, during a particularly spiky period. Uh, and on the live client, you could do that. In the web presentation, in the static presentation, it's not, so, uh, it, uh, not as easily. Uh, do they have a temporal pattern? Yes. And that pattern is usually extraordinarily short-lived. Um, you know, the, the half-life of a hashtag uh, may be shorter than a news cycle. So things come and go really fast. And, um, and then sometimes they come back. Um, remember such hits of yesteryear as border crisis. Hashtag border crisis. Uh, you know, when there were people on our border about to come over the border. And, you know, for, that, for a while, that was like Shark Week. And it, it lived and it grew and then it was gone. And so a lot of these really have very, very periodic, or, or at least just uh, they're short pulses and they're gone. Yeah? Sort of, yeah. Just, yeah it, it, it's, I think about if I were a political operator, let's say, and I don't want to make a Republican into a Democrat, <laughs> the ultimate challenge there. Uh, and I want to look at the effectiveness of the messaging or other tools that I would want to do that with. Well, hmm. then, Yeah, let's see. I, of course, misspelled that. Uh, Cal so what we would do is say, well, let's go look at, let's say, Jerry Brown, governor of the state of California, or uh, I think it was AB 586, which is the new Covered California bill, which essentially says, um, if we can't have health care in America, we will have it in California for all. It's a very controversial term, right? AB 586. You, you, you know, that, that's like, we're going to do socialism in California. Uh, you can type AB586 into this tool, pull out the network of who's talking about it. And you very quickly see partisan lines. And you will see within those clusters who are the leaders of these partisans. And then within that cluster, what are the URLs that are most frequently mentioned? What other hashtags are, are essentially marching with this hashtag? Uh, if you are an you know, anti-vaxxer, or I think it was 
Oh, I can't remember the, the assembly bill, 286, I think. Uh, the governor signed a bill a year and a half, two years ago, which said, if you want to go to California schools, you will be vaccinated. And, and guess what? That was controversial. And you could really see wh who, who was who and, and why, uh, who thought it was controversial and for what reason. So, um, yeah, here's SB 2562 and here's CalWeg. So we, we could zoom in on uh, this hashtag. This is CalWeg, the California legislature. And so it's a hashtag for inside baseball kinds of political news junkies. And it's illustrating the shape of the graph. Uh, but it also will tell us who are the 10 most central people talking about California state politics at the state house level. Uh, those are those people. Helpfully, we are providing you with a follow button because, you know, you might follow them. Uh, and then the smart tweet button, which uh, allows us to uh, suggest how would you talk to that person. This is a very important person. You might want to talk to them about what they care about. We analyze their content and bring up two hashtags and two words that are salient to them, which suggests uh, it is not the uh, final draft. This is the first draft. You, you would use this as uh, your prompt. Use these words in a sentence. So with these tools, I hope that you could see that there are some applications to political discussions or the study thereof as well. I don't think maybe we, we have one more question. Can we? No. One good question. Right there, sir. I just wonder uh, if you've done some work or if you know work about networks that are more resistant to trolling and uh, if I use the mm -hmm. analogy, do we have elements which are more robust or less robust? That's a good question. Uh, I would argue that the, the last election cycle here in the United States has opened up an entire new area of network science research about disinformation. And there is an enormous desire to fix fake news. Uh, I come from a part of the university that thinks that truth left the room about 120 years ago and that there is no thing that is true, not true. Uh, however, I think what we can do for you is offer uh, the idea of information provenance, which isn't to say, is it true or is it not true? but says who? Where did this idea come from? And that, I think, might be something that network science can offer us as a solution to that problem. Okay. Thank you, Alexi. Appreciate it.